A few months ago, I made a video reviewing every Half-Life 2 mod with its own Steam page. It ended up doing a lot better than I expected it to, so here's a sequel of sorts, every Half-Life 1 mod with its own Steam page. Modding is a big part of Half-Life 1. Modding was supported and encouraged by Valve, resulting in thousands of mods created by fans. Some mods would distinguish themselves by becoming franchises of their own, like Counter-Strike and Team Fortress. Most would end up residing on websites like Run, Shoot, Think, Live or ModDB, but some Half-Life mods would stick out by putting themselves on Steam, the same platform Valve used to sell the original game. So today I want to look into these mods and see if they deserve a place alongside the classic game that created them. But just a few rules first. We'll cover mod Steam lists as community mods when you browse the Half-Life 1 Steam store page. We'll also cover single player mods, no multiplayer mods. As you can see from the length of the video, this is going to be a long one. So grab a snack and drink and get comfortable. Or feel free to use the timestamps to jump around the video where you need to. All right then, let's begin. Half-Life Before is a short campaign that will take you less than 30 minutes to complete. This mod takes place on a cargo ship. You need to fight aliens until you reach the cargo hold, which has one boss fight to kill before the mod ends. There are a few new weapon models introduced, including a new pistol and crossbow. The entire thing runs on the spirit of Half-Life engine, an upgraded version of Gold Source, which appears to be powering some of the new animations and effects in the mod. For some reason, this mod has a very negative score on Steam. I don't understand why the community decided to go so hard against this mod. Yes, the mod is really short, but it's competently made and adds a few new graphical models and effects. It's not an ugly, unbalanced mess, like Arctic Adventures for Half-Life 2 which also has a similarly most, mostly negative score. Perhaps people are offended that this game is occupying space on the Steam store page. And maybe they are right. A campaign should have a good length to get its own Steam page. But I can't say I didn't enjoy the time I spent playing this mod. So if a sub 30 minute length mod doesn't offend you, I'd say this mod is worth checking out if you're going through Half-Life 1 mods. In Half-Life Caged, you're sent to a prison on an isolated island. That's just the bad news. The worst news is your termination is going to happen in just a few minutes. Hang around your cell and you'll die like a chump. But move some boxes around, and blow the steam pipe up, and start your prison escape as the kick-ass music starts playing. <laughs> this mod has a ton of personality and polish. The soundtrack that plays during the major gunfights gets your heart pumping. There are several bits of dark humour scattered across the maps, with several easter eggs to find, giving the mod a bit of replay value. While colourwise the prison is a bit bland, I like the design of the CRT monitors and the old computers. There's something about the lighting that just makes them pop, and the models look pretty crisp. We also get a few new weapon models, a plunger instead of the crowbar, a new Glock, and a different looking SMG. It's not the most original premise for a mod, but it's all just very well executed. Excuse the pun. I must warn you though, this mod is pretty difficult. Health packs can be pretty scarce, depending on the map. And soldier enemies you fight throughout the mod can drop you pretty fast. So be prepared to load a few saves. This mod is on the short side, with it taking about 30 minutes to an hour to complete. Depending on how many times you die as well. It does have enough quality for it to deserve a spotlight on Steam for sure though.
What's your opinion on headcrabs? Do you think they can make good pets like Dr. Kleiner? Or do you want to smash every headcrab around you like Barney? If you lean towards Barney, this mod might be good for you. Headcrab Frenzy is an arcade style minigame where you smash headcrabs. You pick an arena and start running around in a small room, bashing an immeasurable amount of headcrabs, all trying to mate with you. You'll inevitably get hit of course, so your health will regenerate. The regeneration rate getting higher the faster you move. You also have 5 lives before your run ends too. Keep bashing headcrabs and you'll eventually spawn power-ups such as invisibility, increased health, regeneration and invulnerability. The headcrabs also have their own tricks too, with multiple variants including fast headcrabs, exploding headcrabs, freezing headcrabs, invisible headcrabs and poison headcrabs. All of which are introduced as your run progresses. Meanwhile you have a Quake 3 style announcer telling you whenever you do something awesome, like getting a triple kill. Don't kill. There's not much more to add, you'll probably get at least 10 minutes of enjoyment out of it. Maybe more depending on how much you enjoy the minigame. While it seems a little insubstantial to deserve its own Steam page, I do think it's cool that something like this is made. Only a healthy and, mo and active modding scene could make a headcrab bashing minigame mod. Half-Life Restored promises to bring a new spin to Half-Life by restoring unused and cut features in the campaign. There are a few things you'll quickly notice as you make your way through the intro and trigger the Resonance Cascade incident. First, you'll notice the game appears to be using vanilla-friendly enhanced textures, likely AI upscale textures. The models for both NPCs and weapons appear to have gotten the same treatment too keeping a vanilla look while upping the graphical fidelity. I believe the sound effects may have been adjusted too. Listen to the pistol's gunshot and tell me if I'm imagining things. The HEV suit has also gotten a couple of its cut voice lines restored such as the message it gives when you acquire a new weapon, making the suit a lot more chatty compared to the vanilla game. The flashlight appears to have gotten an upgrade too. The light is more vivid and wide compared to the vanilla one. One of the cooler additions is this neat idle animation for the shotgun. One not so nice addition is the performance issues. It's not a chop fest by any means, but there was more than one occasion where I'd get slowdowns and freezes. But truthfully, I didn't notice anything that, anything that really put a new spin on Half-Life. Every change was minor or very subtle. So much so that some of the changes I've mentioned may not actually be changes at all. I got up to Meat Locker in Office Complex, before deciding it wasn't really worth my time to continue to catalogue the changes, based on the small changes experienced so far. Perhaps I'm not enough of a Half-Life superfan to notice and appreciate all the changes made. If you really know Half-Life maps, models and textures like the back of your hand, you may get more out of this experience than I did. I do see some value from this mod in the sense that it essentially gives you a vanilla friendly version of the HD texture pack, improving the graphical fidelity while keeping the style and look of vanilla Half-Life. Otherwise it seems like there's not much you're missing out on with this mod, especially since you can get upscaled vanilla textures and models if you're familiar with installing mods. Do you like Call of Duty Zombies and Half-Life 1? Well this mod may be for you. 
This mod has been in development for more than 10 years and brings the Call of Duty Zombies Wave experience to the Half-Life 1 enemy roster, in both single player and co-op modes. You pick from a list of maps, choose a class, and then have to defend yourself from waves of Zen and Race X aliens attacking your barricades. You have a basic blaster that deals weak damage, but has unlimited ammo. Each kill nets you some money, which you can use to open up other areas of the map, purchase new weapons and ammo, buy items, or open up random prize boxes containing random items and ammo. There are a couple of differences from Call of Duty Zombies. You can save your progress every 10 waves. And while I didn't get too far into it, I believe there is an equipment and loot system. Personally, I don't find horde modes that interesting, so I didn't play too much, but from what I played, I enjoyed it more than Call of Duty Zombies. The enemy rust of Half-Life 1 is far more interesting than the simple zombies and hellhounds in that game mode. This mod fe definitely feels substantial and deserving of a place on Steam, especially if you can get into the mod's progression. I've played every Half-Life official release except for Half-Life Decay. Half-Life Decay was the final Gearbox expansion, released with the PlayStation 2 port of the game. It's a co-op only experience that was never officially released on PC. Before Half-Life Alex released, it was hands down the entry with the most barriers to play. There have been several successful efforts to make the PS2 files playable on the Half-Life 1 engine. But to my knowledge, there's no easy way to play this forgotten episode of Half-Life 1. When I saw Half-Life Decay solo mission, I was quite pleased. A single player conversion of Half-Life Decay would be my ideal way to play it. What we have here is actually a demo. The demo has three of nine chapters playable, leaving about a third of the game complete. Decay follows two female scientists in Black Mesa, Colette Green and Gina Cross. In the original game, you and your co-op partner control both, but here we only control Gina Cross. I guess she was chosen since she appears most during the Half-Life 1 saga. In Blue Shift on a security camera, in Half-Life 1 as the training hologram instructor, and her body is seen in Opposing Force. Gina arrives at work and her first task is to deliver the Zen Crystal sample that causes the Resonance Cascade. After that, the rest of the demo follows her efforts to help Rosenberg go to the communication center and contact the military. So we can see what a big help she was to all the Black Mesa staff. Granted, she was only trying to help and doing the logical thing. The level design from the original Decay seems to be here with a few adjustments. All puzzles which require co-op have been adjusted so Cross can complete them herself. The enemy account seems to have been adjusted to account for just one player's weapons. One highlight is the second chapter, which takes us through the hazard course post-resonance cascade, structurally wrecked and full of zen aliens. Going through old environments that are devastated and wrecked is usually a lot of fun, and this is no exception, especially given how many times I've ran the hazard course over the years. Another nice touch about the mod is the addition of subtitles. Half-Life 2 style subtitles are present for dialogue. As someone who is hearing impaired, it's nice to see working subtitles in Gold Source. Overall, this is a nice demo with about 50 minutes of content to go through. It leaves me excited to see this mod's full release and what else will be present. I think most Half-Life fans would agree that the shooting mechanics of Half-Life have never been amazing. It's always been at best serviceable. Level design, pacing, story, these are areas where the Half-Life series excelled at. I don't think it would be too presumptuous of me to say that Valve would agree too. When you look at Half-Life 2 and its episodes, you'll notice guns have never been a big focus of those games. Modders of course have never been one to accept the limitations of the base game. One of the more successful mods has been the Half-Life 2 M mod. A version made for Half-Life 1 is now available, Half-Life M mod. 
M-Mod promises to revamp the gunplay of Half-Life 1, and it does a pretty good job. Gun models, sounds, and every visual effect related to weapons has been updated to be much more visually pleasing and impactful. weapons resemble the original weapons instead of the Gearbox HD models, which is a nice touch. The feel of the weapons has been adjusted too, with more impactful recoil and power. From what I've played, the balancing seems right. Shootouts with the military feel more or less like the original. I've never felt that my weapons were more, more or less effective compared to the base game. The mod also brings a fair few additions. One of the more noticeable changes is the main menu, which features a chapter select like Half-Life 2. The HEV suit has some of its cut lines restored, such as when you pick up a new weapon. The UI has some more detailed information too showing you your health and HEV more clearly, and identifying when you pick up ammo or reload your weapon. Some weapons have alternate modes too, such as the pistol which lets you attach a silencer. You can even get your hands on the opposing force teleport gun, which decimates everything in its path. The options menu has a new tab dedicated to adjusting some of the new features, like choosing a new difficulty or enabling first person legs. Speaking of legs, you can see your full body by default, which is a nice touch. Some of the new visual effects when it comes to explosions and gunfire are marvel to see. Overall, M-Mod does a good job of bringing the gunplay of Half-Life 1 to, mo to modern standards. It's probably the best gameplay modifier for Half-Life 1 out there, despite being released recently. I would recommend this mod if you want to replay the main game. If you don't mind getting a non-vanilla experience, it's also not a bad way to experience the main game for the first time too. Have you ever wanted to experience the Black Mesa research facility in virtual reality? Experience the corridors and chambers literally surrounding you, seeing your weapon move as your hands move, feel the zombies and headcrabs in your personal space when they get close? Well, you're in luck because there's two ways to experience Half-Life 1 in virtual reality. You have the Team Beef port, Lambda VR, which is only available in Oculus Quest headsets, which is feature complete as well. Or you have the Half-Life 1 VR mod, which is available on PC Virtual Reality and available in Early Access State. Half-Life 1 VR mod was actually the first attempt to make Half-Life 1 playable in VR, releasing in 2017 as a GitHub repository. It was released in Early Access on Steam with its own Steam page in 2022 possibly encouraged by Half-Life 2 VR mod's successful early access release. This mod has a few things going for it over the feature complete Lambda VR. First is that it runs on PC. Mobile apps and software are notorious for losing support or just plain not working after a few years, unlike PC games. Second is that you interact with the world using your hands. Lambda VR by default features floating weapons and interaction via controller button presses. This makes Half-Life 1 VR mod more immersive in several areas, such as physically pressing buttons, or climbing up ladders using your hands, or seeing your hands as you aim your weapons. Third, it runs on the Gold Source engine, which was used for the retail release of the game. Lambda VR runs on the Zash engine, or Xash engine. This may improve compatibility for mods and custom campaigns, but don't quote me on that. 
Unfortunately, the list of negatives tend to outweigh the good. First is the performance. The frame rate felt consistently low throughout the experience. The frame rate counter on the recording suggests it hovers around 40 frames per, 40 frames per second. This is pretty bad for virtual reality as low frame rates can make you feel motion sick, which I did feel at several times. I was going to say that the ladder climbing felt janky in earlier versions of, versions of the script, but reflecting on it, I'm convinced the bad frame rate was responsible for that feeling. Another issue is the interface. It looks like a work in progress, which I'm sure it is. I do have one subjective issue with the mod. The inclusion of the female scientists among the NPCs. It's not the fact that they are included that bothers me. Black Mesa added female, in female scientists, making their inclusion feel natural. It's the way they are included. It seems like around half the scientists are replaced with female variants including some notable ones, like the scientists arguing before you enter the test chamber. They end up sticking out like a sore thumb, especially when you consider that virtually everything else in this mod is a one-to-one -one match with the original release. I don't want to talk too much about this though, as I'd rather leave the identity politics can of worm closed. But I feel like it should be said. I don't think implementing it this way was a good choice for the mod that's trying to bring the original Half-Life 1 to VR. If this mod can solve those issues, I think this may end up being better than Lambda VR in the end. So I do hope to see some improvements to this mod over the coming year. Otherwise, if you have a Quest headset, I would recommend Lambda VR over this. It's feature complete and much more stable. If you don't have a Quest headset, you can certainly play this, but you'll feel the early access status of it. This entry is a bit of a cheat. This mod doesn't actually have its own Steam page. You have to download it from ModDB. But I'll let it slide for two reasons. First, you need to run this mod through Steam to play it without technical issues. Second, this mod is frigging amazing. Half-Life Echoes began development in 2014 by a single modder, James Cobert. It was released in 2018 to critical praise. So much so that it would get coverage in mainstream gaming press and get its own Wikipedia page. A feat few mods have achieved. Echoes follows a unnamed scientist, referred to as Candidate 12. Like many other Half-Life 1 mods, they arrive at work and make their way to their lab. However, there is no tram sequence. Instead, we must walk. As we go through these environments, the tone of the incoming disaster is set as we see several signs of structural and maintenance issues throughout the facility. What the hell is going on with our equipment? Oh, I can't wrap my brain around it. Help! Someone let us out of here! I know, sir, I know. We're doing everything we can. There's also quite a few references to catch along the way. You can see Gina Cross and Colette Green's feet in the women's bathroom. The G-Man, the machine that would bring the deadly Zen crystal to the test chamber, and even Dr. Keller closing the elevator door on us. It's a long walk, but it pays off, as Echoes will take us through these same environments again, but under much different conditions. As the mod events progress, we'll see the same environments go from a working laboratory to a structurally decimated base, to a decimated base infested with Zen flora. I would say it's a smart way to reuse maps already made, but there's enough changes that these maps feel, def feel very different and require different sets of geometry and effects. Eventually, we get our own unique perspective of the Resonance Cascade incident, and awake somewhere underground. Alone and unarmed, we skulk through the dark corridors, hoping to evade the headcrabs and zombies stalking the halls. This is one aspect of the mod that surprised me. These early parts were genuinely scary. The use of lighting, sound, enemy placement, and resource placement brings out the horror aspects of Half-Life better than the base game or its expansions ever did. While we do get our hands on a crowbar, 
It's quite some time till we get our hands on a pistol. 45 minutes to be exact. And before we get our hands on that, we get a terrifying alien isolation style encounter with this... thing. Even when we do get our hands on some firearms, resources are still quite tight, especially health packs, keeping the survival horror atmosphere going. This is also when the Gargantua starts chasing us. Reminding us that we can de while we can defend ourselves, we are still very much out of our depth. Eventually you do manage to reach the surface, and things start focusing more on action. We attempt to find a security guard with access codes to the outside. This plan doesn't go according to plan, and we're forced to backtrack. facing fierce military resistance as we try to make our way out of Black Mesa. I hope the footage has made this clear, but the environments in this mod are fantastic. They are large, expansive, full of detail, and the lighting is very well done. Once again, the Gold Source engine appears to have been pushed to its limits with elaborate scripted sequences and large NPC counts in certain areas. There's clearly also been a lot of work fine-tuning the level design. There's not much in the way of new weapons or enemies. Instead, the mod takes what Half-Life 1 provides and uses it incredibly well. Everything feels just right in terms of pacing and combat. There's some pretty good ambushes with how the enemies have been placed. And for the most part, it feels shocking, but not cheap. Health pickups seem to have been fine-tuned a lot. During earlier parts of the mod, I was often near death, making things tenser, while later on it seems you have just enough pickups to keep you going. A nice bonus on top of this is that there are several references to Half-Life 2, mainly when G-Man crosses paths with Candidate 12. There's even a few references to the Epistle 3 story outline link. If I only had a few words to describe how, how I felt about Echoes, I would say Half-Life Echoes is what we'll get if Valve decided to make a new Half-Life 1 expansion. That is high praise, and if you haven't played it, I would highly recommend making it your next game to play once you finish this video. It definitely deserves to be highlighted with its own Steam Store page, even if it doesn't have one. Half Quake is an interesting mod. The first thing that stuck out to me was actually the main menu. This twisted mess is a fully functional main menu. You can still rebind your keys, change your resolution, save and load your game. Everything has just been renamed. For example, key bindings are fingers, while loading is die again. The whole thing had me unnerved before I could click new game. Excuse me, I meant start dying. We spawn in this room which has three hallways, reminiscent of Quake 1's difficulty select screen. Which is the closest this mod gets to be actually being Quake. Each hallway represents each part of this trilogy. The leftmost is the first part, Half Quake, which was released in 2001. The middle hallway, Half Quake, Amen was released in 2010, and the right hallway, Half Quake Sunrise, was released in 2012. In 2018, these three mods were packaged into one Half Quake trilogy, and released on Steam. It's been a long journey for these mods, so I better not dawdle any longer. Half Quake feels like your standard purposefully hard Half-Life mod. You've been, you've been put into hell to die for the amusement of the architects of this dungeon, as stated earlier, I was unnerved by the main menu, expecting horror, but instead of horror you get a bunch of hard challenge rooms. A lot of precarious platforming, combat ambushes, and sudden hazards. There's variety and personality to it, but compared to the other two parts of this trilogy, it feels a bit generic. 
Half Quake, Amen, and Sunrises where things start to get interesting. The mod goes all in on its unique aesthetic and soundtrack. The visuals have an interesting style. The absolute darkness combined with the grainy brickwork and abstract shapes create this creepy hell slash limbo style environment. After playing a bit of the first part, I was pretty confident we weren't going to get any serious survival horror, but I couldn't help but be unnerved. At the very least, I was half expecting Jeff the Killer to show up and jump scare me, or some other popular 2000s internet character used for jump scares. But ultimately, there's not much horror here. It's really just a bunch of punishingly difficult challenge rooms, with most testing your platforming skills. It feels like a mean version of Dark Souls. If you approach a new area slowly, you can potentially spot all the traps and sudden hazards, but it's still going to take a fair bit of luck and quick saves to get through. There's actually a good amount of variety to the maps. You have a questionnaire that will kill you if you pick the wrong answer. A killer train. Signs claiming to be exits that lead you to holes you can't climb out of. This glass walkway that looks like it came straight out of Squid Game. A room that makes you think you're going to drown just, before, just letting you go before you die. If you try going through the tutorial levels in Amen and Sunrise, you'll just end up, get, end up getting mocked by the instructor but before being eventually killed. Yeah. Get killed by random explosion. Oh, I love that part. There's a lot to see here and many things you won't predict. What I described just scratches the surface of what's here. That's because I have not finished any of the parts of this mod. Unfortunately, I'm not the masochist that this game is looking for. Only with the level select screen was I able to see ahead of part one. The Steam Store promises 15 hours of agonizing gameplay, and I can certainly believe that. If you're the kind of person that enjoys I Wanna Be The Guy, Cat Mario, and punishingly difficult Dark Souls challenge runs, this mod may be your thing. For everyone else, let's all be thankful Bollocks uploaded full playthrough, so we can see all the crazy things this mod throws at, it, throws at us. So those are all the single-player Half-Life 1 mods I could find on Steam. It's a bit of a mixed bag. We have some really tightly designed and well-executed mods like Half-Life Caged and Half-Quake. Off-the-wall ideas like Headcrab Frenzy, adaptions of official Half-Life games like Decay Solo Mission, and Labors of Love worthy of being official Half-Life games like Half-Life Echoes. In some ways, this list represents Half-Life 1 modding both well and not so well. A lot of notable Half-Life 1 mods predate Steam, so I wasn't able to mention some well-known mods like They Hunger, Black Ops, or Timeline. Those are just a few of the great mods available on the internet. But I feel like this list covers just how diverse Half-Life 1 mods are. The barrier to entry for creating a Half-Life 1 mod is pretty low. With community and developer support, it really flourished, resulting in mods that followed the structure of the base game, mods that tried different ideas and style, and mods that created their own game modes and wacky ideas that would never make it in a retail game back in 1998. As usual, I'd like to thank all the modders who produced and distributed these mods. I will include links to each mod and credits in the description, so do check them out if you want to try these mods. So that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'd love to see a like and your thoughts in the comments. There's definitely going to be more videos in the future, so please subscribe to see more videos. See you in another video. Until then, have a nice day. Bye.